السلام عليكم السلام عليكم مساء الخير جميعا نستكمل الان ورشه العمل مع الدكتور ايمن بما يخص السيرجيكال سايد انفكشن سيرفيلنس تفضل دكتور شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم
one month data well, at least one month maybe you can collect it for two months three months or the whole year it is fine uh, so remaining the issue or the question is which surgery i should do do i have to do all surgeries surveillance or do certain types of surgeries uh, which type if we are doing a specific surgery which one so the answer for this is not easy but for the first one uh, all operation no we we don't do ssi for all surgeries we only choose few one two three four for example surgeries and we we do surveillance for this type of surgery uh, if we have to choose do we have to choose high volume surgery or high risk uh, surgeries high volume surgery means surgery that is done frequently in the hospital like uh, c-section one of the most common uh, surgeries done is c-section uh, so here uh, should we include c-section or high risk surgery like colon surgery is associated usually with high rate of infection so which one you can take one high volume and one high risk but the baseline if you have uh, complaints about the rate from any surgery probably this is a good candidate uh, for surveillance uh, so there is no single choice here uh, however if we are doing uh, national data uh, they usually specify one surgery and in the us they specify colon surgery and hysterectomy as two surgeries for all um, hospital they want to contribute data they should contribute these two types of uh, surgeries only for the sake of unifying the report but it's not mandatory that you use this surgery unless you want to share your data with the national data that is created for uh, these two types of surgery of course we do uh, surveillance for all different surgeries but one at a time not all of them together we may do for example uh, cholecystectomy, uh, hysterectomy, um, C-section, each one for three months if the number is enough. Uh, if the number is small, maybe we need to do the whole year of data like hip replacement or knee replacement, usually few numbers of this surgery done. So we do like a year of data before we can calculate a good rate. How we do this, uh, the methods, how we do the SSI surveillance, exactly as we said before in the CLAPSI yesterday, we said active surveillance. Uh, so we actively looking for information, patient based, we don't depend only on the lab, but also for the patient signs and symptoms. Prospective surveillance, we started the surveillance while the patient is, is still in hospital and continue this for some time. Uh, we will specify the time to, for you here in this lecture. Priority directed, we only do some types of specific surgeries based on the risk assessment, as we said. Uh, risk adjusted rates, and we uh, stratify the rate by the risk index category. We will show you this later, inshallah. Um, uh, to just to be to just be aware that SSI surveillance is the only surveillance uh, that we do, which have uh, which has um, most discharge surveillance. So. In all types of surveillance, if the patient leave the hospital, we don't follow the patient. But only in SSI, if the patient leave the hospital, we still follow for the development of SSI for at least one month, and in other sur some surgeries, three months before we can say he he or she does not have or does not or didn't develop uh, any infection. So uh, for the active surveillance, uh, we should uh, look for the information about the surgery from different sources. So it's not single source. So we collect the data from admission, readmission, ER, OR logs. Uh, so we, we use this uh, any any of these lists to get the the number of patients who did certain surgery, for example, like. You want to know how many did the uh, cholecystectomy. You have to look for OR logs for those who come with the, to the ER with the cholecystectomy infected uh, incision and so on. Patient chart. When you know the uh, your your patients, you can you should go to the patient chart and collect the signs and symptoms related to SSI. Sometimes we need to go to the laboratory imaging, other diagnostic reporting, also to collect information. 
professional notes, surgical notes, anesthesia notes are also okay. Um, ICD-10 uh, codes uh, also okay. So we use different sources and we, we also can uh, uh, see the visits to ICU and ward. Uh, we can uh, uh, speak uh, with the uh, surgical team. Uh, we can do surgical survey for our patients either by mail or phone. Um, uh, and and we can uh, ask the patient to report by mail or phone any changes in their incision. So basically, you don't have to follow all of them, but as much as you can out of these uh, different uh, methods, you need to 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 follow. Uh, which means what? Which means is um, you're looking for something. Uh, it's called SSI that you usually develop after the patient to leave the hospital. Very few are uh, are detected while the patient uh, is still in the hospital after doing the surgery. So since you are looking for something happen in home, uh, you need to have more information, either by talking to the patient himself uh, through the phone, giving a certain card to send later, uh, or have a card that they will uh, uh, get uh, and submit during the outpatient visits after the surgery to follow up a uh, card. So whatever method that's suitable in your country, your uh, city, uh, please use it. So there is no ideal way. And some of these ways like uh, mail, for example, is uh, common in US, not common here in Saudi Arabia. So there is no standard, uh, not no standard, there is no perfect method. You have to use multiple overlapping method to get most of the information. And this is a list of the operative procedures uh, that are allowed to do surveillance on uh, according to the NHSN. And as you see here, each, uh, each surgery has a code, the code usually three or four uh, letters, uh, like AB, it's appendix. Uh, CBGB means uh, coronary bypass uh, surgery with uh, both schist and uh, donor uh, incision, schist only. Uh, colo is colon surgery, uh, and so on. Uh, and there is a description of what does it mean. Uh, this is cholecystectomy or uh, cholecystotomy. Uh, Craniotomy means excision, repair, exploration of the brain. Uh, or meninges does not include uh, taps or punctures. So what does it mean, this type of... So this is not a surgery, it's a group of surgery. Uh, this is what we wanted to tell you. And uh, they are arranged alphabetically from uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, AAA. Um, so the next uh, slide uh, show you the rest of this, uh, uh, like heart transplant until ventricular shunt. Uh, and as you see here, um, the the code, the name of the operative procedure groups, and the uh, description. And uh, if we take these uh, three examples, and uh, just to tell you that you cannot do single surgery, you should do a group of surgery, uh, like breast, for example. Breast, BRST, is uh, breast surgery, and this is include different types of surgery done on the breast, um, like excision of lesion or tissue of breast during uh, radical mastectomy, modified mastectomy, quadrant resection, lumbectomy, incisional biopsy, or mammoblasty. So from plastic surgery to cancer, to diagnosis, to lumbectomy, to uh, incisional biopsy, different types of surgery done in the breast should be included together in one group called breast surgery. So if somebody do uh, only uh, radical mastectomy, uh, is this right? No, we we as I said, to get the right rate that you can compare it uh, to NHSN and other uh, uh, like benchmark, you need to follow the same group. Also here, uh, cabbage means the coronary bypass surgery, which uh, they take one of the uh, arteries or veins and insert it uh, to replace the 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 uh, the blocked coronary artery 
if they take this from the schist, schist only, if they take from the schist and the, uh, sorry, from the, the leg, it's called schist and donor incision. Uh, and so on. So I'm, I'm not going to go through all, all surgery to describe it. Uh, what you need to do before you do, you do surveillance, you need to ask, uh, what is this type of surgery? What are surgeries included? And there is a, a better way or easier way uh, for doing this. They have here a website. Uh, you can go to this website and find out what are the uh, different surgery under each operative procedure. And we have 39 uh, of them. And they uh, categorized based on the current uh, procedure terminology, uh, procedure code mapping to NHSN. So uh, I, I guess I have an example here. Uh, for example, this is appendix. Uh, it includes different uh, CBT codes. Uh, this is the NHSN code. Uh, this is CBT codes, which different types of surgeries, incision and drainage of a cell, abscess, open incision, appendectomy, removal of the appendix, appendectomy when done for indicated purpose, appendectomy for ruptured appendix, laparoscopy, uh, surgical removal of appendix, unlisted uh, laparoscopy procedure appendix. So all these different situations that you can have surgery on appendix. And again, each type of, uh, each one of the 39 group have list of uh, this type. So this would help you uh, find out the patient who did this different types of surgery so when you define to yourself what are surgeries including this group you can easily uh, and sometimes your hospital have named this surgery differently so you will be uh, you should be uh, aware of the names of the different surgeries and list them in one piece of paper and go find out cases that are doing this type of surgery uh, the next group of information is the event details uh, or SSI event details. So uh, how long we should do surveillance? Uh, basically, uh, we're looking for SSI after that develop after or within, sorry, uh, 30 days after surgery or 90 days after surgery. And the choice between 30 and 90 is not our choice. It is uh, already predetermined based on the surgery itself. So a group of surgery, you should follow for 30 days only. A group of surgery should follow for 90 days. Uh, making sure that superficial incision is always 30 days for any surgery. Deep an organ could be 30 or 90 according to the type of surgery. Secondary incision is only 30 days. Uh, for all types of surgery. So superficial uh, primary or secondary is 30 days all the time. Secondary incision is 30 days all the time. Deeper organ incision can be 30 or 90 according to the surgery. And we have a list for that. So uh, this is the list for 30 day surgery. You don't have to memorize which surgery in this list, but at least you know there is a list for 30 day surgery and it includes most of the surgeries, uh, but there is also another list for 90 days uh, uh, surveillance surgery. And they are few, yani if, you, if you see, these are uh, the all the surgeries that has 90 days uh, and uh, more or less, I'm not going, uh, this is not a, a, a official information, but more or less these surgeries are including uh, including the surgery that have implant. Uh, for example, craniotomy has a, a implant to cover the skull. Uh, hernia usually have a mesh. Hip usually have uh, a new uh, synthetic hip joint. Breast usually, uh, not always, but uh, sometimes they put uh, breast implant. Uh, cardiac, they put uh, valve and so on. Uh, so these are surgery that uh, has an implant usually, and that's why they extend the duration of follow-up from 30 days to 90 days to allow uh, for any infection that could have been late in the uh, prosthesis or the 
uh, implant uh, uh, later on. Usually it takes more time in the uh, to discover this uh, infection. That's why they increase the surveillance or monitoring from 30 days to 90 days for only the surgeries. Other types of surgery is 30 days. So this is the only 90 day surgery. Uh, what is the date of event? The date of event uh, is similar to other types of uh, surveillance. It's the first element used to meet the criteria uh, uh, during the surveillance. Event. Uh, remember, there is no window like uh, in SSI, CAUT, VAB, VAE. There is a window, maybe five days in VE, seven days in other device associated. Uh, but in, in SSI, there is no window. There is no seven day window. But uh, they said, if you have symptoms, for example, say the symptoms are fever, bus, and pain. Uh, they should happen within a few days. Yeah, and don't take fever from the beginning of the month with bus in the end of the month and say these are together. No, they have to happen within seven to ten days, no more than two to three days between each of the elements. So they haven't to they have to happen together either on the same day, the same week, the same 10 days, but not apart, but more more, more than 10 days. This is this is just a, a guideline, not uh, uh, strict uh, there is no strict uh, timing. But um, I'm trying to say they have to be together. And um, this slide is very interesting. I like it. Uh, and this is a study that has been done in Pennsylvania, um, USA. And it shows when the SSI happened or detected. And they did like uh, follow up of more than 4,000 uh, surgeries. And then find that the most of the surgery, 43%, are discovered between 8 and 18 days, which means in the uh, second uh, week mainly, mainly the second week or uh, the second and the first half of the third week after the surgery. So usually it does not happen in the first seven days. What happened in the first seven days, no more than 5%. It's 5%. So if you're waiting to detect the SSI while the patient is in the hospital, you are looking for only 5% of SSI. So people who do not do post-discharge surveillance in a good way usually report very low SSI rate. And the SSI rate is one of the misleading rates. Uh, your hospital can report very low SSI rate. This is not, not because your hospital have less SSI rate, but actually it is because you don't do good surveillance for post discharge surveillance because only seven, uh, five percent or less during in the seven days. And usually 90 percent of the surgery patient leave within the first week, usually after two or three days, they are allowed to go home uh, and continue care in home. Uh, as you see, few, uh, a good number also, it's not few, like 20 percent can happen after 30 days, and that's why they created this 90 days for head, for knee, for breast, for cabbage surgery, then uh, they created 90 days. And this is uh, this slide uh, uh, tell us that the, the highest rate of SSI detection would be in the second week, maybe later in the third week and fourth week. Uh, after the fourth week, a little, but it can happen in some types of surgeries. Uh, a question is, can I have a secondary BSI after SSI? Yes. And actually, both scenarios can happen after uh, SSI. What does it mean? Somebody had uh, have S, uh, has SSI, and after uh, after SSI, he got, he got bloodstream infection. And the organism... Uh, similar in both the SSI and the the bloodstream infection. In this case, uh, it is uh, called uh, first scenario of uh, secondary BSI. So the organism are matching uh, the BSI having within uh, bloodstream infection having or post blood culture having within 17 days uh, from uh, the the date of uh, SSI. Then it is called 
uh, uh, secondary BSI and you don't report this. You put it in the SSI form. And as you see here, you need two things. You need a positive wound, wound with the bacteria, and a matching positive blood during the BSI attribution period, which is 17 days from the date of event to the date of SSI. But also another way of uh, detecting secondary BSI is to have uh, uh, criteria for SSI, usually organ SSI, and the infection uh, does not have an uh, organism. Yani, uh, yes, they detected uh, the SSI, but clinically. Uh, and uh, the organism is identified only in blood. And in this case, they can you can diagnose secondary BSI uh, based on the second scenario and based on the uh, the criteria for organ SSI. Uh, usually, blood specimen uh, is part of the criteria. Uh, so, if you look at this criteria, for example, this is like intra-abdominal infection. The criteria is having fever, nausea, or abdominal pain positive blood specimen during window and CT scan showing abdominal cavity, uh, showing abscess in the abdominal cavity or infection uh, signs and symptoms, uh, signs. So since the, the positive blood culture is one of the criteria to diagnose organ SSI of some organ SSI like uh, intra-abdominal infection, no need to have two organisms, one from the wound and one from the blood. The blood is enough no matching is needed and usually this happen with different uh, surgeries different organ based surgery like uh, gastrointestinal infection intra-abdominal infection meningitis spinal abscess osteomyelitis disc space infection endometritis endocarditis and so on so uh, if you have one of these surgeries uh, and one of the this surgeries uh, and and these surgeries have in their definition post plaque culture and you have a positive blood culture, but you don't have a wound culture, um, you still can consider the positive blood culture as secondary BSI. It's part of the definition of the organ space SSI and cannot be primary BSI. The, the first scenario is very easy. You have a wound that has bacteria, like for example, uh, E. coli in the wound and E. coli in the blood. In this case, it's a secondary BSI. In the second scenario, you have E. coli in the blood, there is no E. coli in the wound, but the E. coli in the blood is used in the definition of organism-based SSI, and that's why you consider it a secondary BSI, even if there is no matching organism from the wound. Uh, before we go to the next group of uh, information, do you guys have any uh, question? Uh, in the in the SSI event and SSI surveillance uh, topics. Okay, so we will. Uh, uh, let's go to the next group of information, like denominator information. So uh, there is something called primary incision closure, like surgery, definition of surgery, you have an incision and you close it. Uh, type. Some surgery, uh, what does it mean primary closure? Closure of the skin level during the original surgery, regardless of the presence of wires, wicks, drains, or other uh, devices. Yani, uh, as long as incision has been done and attempts to close the skin incision, this means a primary incision closure, even if they don't close it to the total, yani keep part of the incision open to put wires, to put uh, drains or something like that. So these surgeries are included in the uh, uh, surveillance. And just to tell you that even if you don't have primary skin, skin uh, closure, we still continue, uh, we, we, we still include this in the in the surveillance. So it is not a, a requirement for surveillance, but we just tell you there is something called the primary skin closure. And uh, this happened if any attempt close part or all the skin incision. So this is, means primary close. 
in 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 laparoscopic surgeries, uh, we um, in laparoscopic surgeries we do not uh, consider it uh, primary closure unless one of these incision is closed. And usually they do three uh, opening, small opening in the abdomen, for example, to enter the laparoscope, uh, the surgical instruments, the camera. Uh, and, and, and in, in this case, if they close the bigger one and keep the others not closed, this is called the primary closure also. Uh, and this is an example of primary closure. They close it all except only a small part for the drain. They close it all, no drain. They use zebra closure, uh, laparoscope. They have one, two, uh, three, four incision. These small ones is not closed. This big one has been uh, closed. So I will consider all of them as primary closure. What does it mean non-primary closure? Non-primary closure, they keep the skin completely open after the surgery. And this is sometimes a happen in, uh, in uh, exploratory laboratory. They, they open an incision, somebody who had an accident and have uh, shock after accident. So usually they open the abdomen to see if there is internal hemorrhage, if there is something uh, need fixing uh, or surgery in, inside the abdomen. And they keep the skin incision open for one or two or three days uh, just to make sure uh, they have access to the abdomen. Uh, also, some surgeries like uh, cardiac surgery in neonates, they open the incision in the sternum and keep it open, it does not close it at all, uh, because in the neonates, if they do incision in the sternum, they, uh, they, the, the skin fuse very easily in, in neonates, so they don't close it. So this is called non-primary closure. The question, if we have a surgery with non-primary closure, uh, should we include it in the surveillance? The answer is yes. Uh, what does it mean, SSI denominator? SSI denominator means uh, 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 is uh, information that you collect on the surgery that way you will use it when you uh, stratify the SSI rate, including emergency surgery. So emergency surgery has no definition. It's, it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it means non-elective. So if it is not, not, not elective surgery, and according to the policy in your hospital, it's called urgent or emergent, then emergency. General anesthesia, anesthesia used uh, to uh, make the patient unconscious and paralyze, usually by injection. Um, inpatient and outpatient, if the patient stay overnight, it's called inpatient. If they stay, uh, do uh, the, the patient have admission charge on the same calendar day, it's called outpatient. So, uh, Admission discharge in the same calendar day is called outpatient. Admission and discharge in different days is called inpatient procedures. A scope means the surgery was done through a, a, a scope. Could be laparoscope, could be uh, abdominal uh, scope, uh, gastroscope, uh, uh, otolaryngoscope, uh, colonoscopy. So these are uh, surgery done by, by scope. Uh, diabetes means uh, somebody who have the disease uh, as diagnosed by a physician or uh, is managed uh, using uh, insulin or oral hypoglycemic medication. Um, for the risk index category, um, this is a, a way of categorizing the patient for the surgery. I mean, we want to create a rate, but we want to create a rate for those who have high risk of infection and those who have low risk of infection. So stratify the rate by the risk of getting the infection. Like if you have some patient who have multiple comorbidities, he have uh, diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism, uh, heart disease, previous stroke, and he's doing a surgery. Do you expect that this has the same risk of uh, infection as a young lady doing C-section, uh, usually young lady doing C-section should go fine, no infection. But this 
all the guy who have this multiple comorbidities should have or uh, should not should have uh, usually he has higher risk of getting infection so how we can categorize our patient according to the risk of infection uh, we use what is called risk index category so risk index category it is the sum of the risk factors that can increase the risk for getting ssi in a patient who did surgery so what are how we can uh, uh, identify the risk factor the risk factor there are three types of risk factor asa score wound class and operative duration so an asa score is an anesthesia score that classify the patient according to the probability of death um, or probability uh, of being alive. So if the patient get this big numbers, like three, four, or five, this means he has high risk of getting infection. So if the patient uh, uh, has a score of one, two, give it zero, Three, four, five, give it one. One means he has the risk factor for comorbidity. Usually, this uh, count the comorbidity. If the patient have multiple comorbidity that affect his life, probably he will get four or five. Um, five means uh, somebody who is going to die soon. Um, so uh, these numbers uh, means higher risk of comorbidity, high risk of uh, uh, getting death. Uh, so if the patient has a risk of three, four, five, you give it one. One the class, if the class is contaminated, number three, or class number four, dirty, infected, you give it one. Operative duration, if the duration of the surgery is longer than expected, you give it one. If shorter than expected, you give it zero. So each one of these get either one or zero. One means a present, zero means not present. So three, four, five ASA score give one. One the class dirty or contaminated give one. Operative procedure more than uh, the expected cut point, then give it one. So uh, back to ASA score. People who ask what does it mean ASA score? It's American Society of Anesthesiology, Anesthesiology uh, score. And as you see, one is normal patient. Uh, two is normal with mild systemic disease. So if the patient had one or two, give zero, means he is okay. Uh, he's okay to do surgery. He's okay uh, not to get SSI. But if the patient has severe systemic disease, but is still okay, or severe systemic disease, but he's uh, not okay, and the, the, the systemic disease is actually incapacitating and uh, uh, like has the risk on the, the, the life, this four patient who are expected to die soon is number five number six is not included in our uh, surveillance because uh, number six means he's already died means a brain dead brain dead patient so we don't include number six in our surveillance uh, so we include only one to five uh, if the patient is three four five means he has an anesthesia score risk factor and get one if he is uh, getting a score of one or two, uh, then is a score risk factor is zero, means not present. For the one the class, we have clean and clean contaminated. This is okay. Clean means uninfected one, uh, but uninfected one, that is not one of these uh, system, respiratory, elementary, genital, uh, uninfected, unit tract, uh, unit tract. And if the patient has one of these surgery, it cannot be clean surgery, but can be clean contaminated. So clean contaminated means a surgery that is done in respiratory, elementary, genital urinary tract, uh, and the uh, without unusual contamination. Uh, so clean means uninfected wound, not in one of these system, primary closed, or closed drainage. Uh, so number three and four, which means if the patient is three or four contaminated or four dirty or infected, this means he gets a score of one. Uh, contaminated means open, fresh, accidental wound, major breaks and sterile techniques, 
or gross spillage of GIT tract, like while doing the surgery, they accidentally uh, make perforation of the gut and a spillage of fecal matter. They clean it during the surgery, but this is considered now contaminated wound. Dirty or infected is all the traumatic wound devitalize the tissue. They have to remove the devitalized tissue. Uh, wound involving existing clinical infection or perforated viscera. So a patient who is uh, going to do poly, uh, appendectomy after rupture appendix, you know, sometimes if the patient don't go to the doctor early uh, after appendix pain, uh, they may, the appendix may rupture and cause uh, peritonitis and rigid, rigid abdomen. And the patient go for the surgery after already the appendix is ruptured. The abdomen is probably full of uh, pus, and this is called dirty one. Okay, so we have contaminated dirty. If the dirty one, do you have to consider this patient as wound class uh, one? Uh, procedure duration. They have a list of the duration for each surgery. If exceed this list you give it one uh, if doesn't exceed you give it uh, zero and remember that what does it mean duration duration means interval in hours and minutes between the procedure start time and finish time start time is easy start time the time of incision uh finish time is not easy why because according to nhsm uh, uh, finish time means that the patient has completed the surgery, the wound is closed, and all required uh, in, uh, like radiologic uh, studies are done. So the patient has completed his surgery, the skin is closed, and completed also post-operative radiologic studies. Not, uh, not all patients need post-operative radiologic studies, but if they need it, they still uh, considered as part of the surgery. So if the operative duration is more than expected, and expected means 75 percentile of the time uh, used for this type of surgery in a large number of surgeries. And basically we have list of these uh, surgeries and the time, for example, um, if you look at here, uh, breast surgery usually take 196 minutes. If our patient has 200 minutes, 300 minutes, we'll consider this one. If he or she, sorry, if she has surgery 196 or 195 or 190 or 180, 150, two hours, then, then the time duration is, is zero. So duration is zero. If it is less or equal to 196, but if it's more than 196, it will be considered as long duration and this is taking a score of one. So you put the ASA score one or zero, one the class one or zero, both the procedure, sorry, procedure duration one or zero, and you count the sum of this. Uh, uh, so the sum could be zero, 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 is the sum is zero, or one, zero, zero, because the sum is one, and so on. So you have zero, one, two, three, the maximum three, and the minimum is zero. And this is an example. You have somebody who have ASA score one means it is a score three or four or five. One the class is zero, so it is less than the uh, it is uh, uh, it is class one or two. Uh, and procedure duration is one, so it's taking more time than listed. So if you count uh, sum up uh, one plus zero plus one, it is two. So the risk index category for this patient is two. Uh, as you see here, this is uh, a study that was done in 2011, and they said that the risk index category that I have described to you is not enough. There is other risk factors that we should consider, and they uh, made this study on uh, age, ASA score, duration, gender, number of beds, anesthesia, trauma, uh, hospital affiliation, uh, what else, use of in, uh, uh, scope, like endoscope, uh, um, number of beds in the hospital, number of beds. So they use different uh, risk factors. They include 
a lot of risk factor, not only the three risk factor, ASA score, wound class, and uh, surgical duration. Uh, they include other risk factors as well. However, uh, continuing with this way of doing the risk factors for different types of surgery, uh, as you see here, HIP uh, has uh, uh, age, anesthesia, ASA score, duration, uh, type of uh, hip replacement, number of beds in the hospital, trauma, or traumatic or not, not traumatic hip injury. So, based on uh, this data, these are the risk factors. So, basically, to do the same, we cannot compare to the NHS in here. We should do our own analysis for SSI data to create our own risk factors in Saudi Arabia before we can say these are the risk factors for this type of surgery in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, we cannot use this uh, as it is. We should uh, use our own types of uh, analysis. Um, so let's go with the some uh, definition updates. Um, if you see here uh, the skin, this is a cut section, uh, cross sectional uh, uh, cut in the in the skin. As you see, the the upper part of the skin is called uh, upper part of the skin, and the underlying subcutaneous tissue is called superficial uh, skin. And any SSI is called superficial SSI. But the lower part that includes the muscles and fascia, this, if, if, if SSI happen here, it's called deep incisional SSI. If the SSI happen in the organ or the space like peritoneum, like pericardium, like pleura, like mediastinum, uh, it's called organ space SSI. So we can categorize SSI into superficial, deep organ space according if it takes the skin and subcutaneous tissue, it's called superficial. If it takes this, the muscles and fascia, it's called deep. If it takes the organ, the space, we, we name it organ and space SSI. So we can recategorize superficial, deep organ space into primary and secondary. So superficial, incisional, primary, superficial, incisional, secondary, deep, incisional, primary, deep, incisional, secondary. And organ, according to the name of the organ, if it is mediastinum, endometrium, disc, cardiac, breast, bone, uh, uh, intra-abdominal space, and so on. So organ space is defined by the name of the organ, but superficial and deep can be uh, subcategorized into primary and secondary, primary and secondary. Primary means it is the main incision of the surgery. Secondary means it is the donor incision. Sometimes they do surgery, uh, like cabbage surgery, they do the main incision in the chest and they do a secondary incision in the leg to take uh, the softness vein to be in, uh, uh, implanted in the veins around the heart or the arteries around the heart. Uh, and for the, uh, this is uh, uh, like a practical example of two types of surgery, C-section and cabbage surgery. For the C-section, you can have superficial uh, primary, means in the main incision. You can have deep primary in the main incision, but we do not have a secondary incision, so we don't have secondary. So for C-section, we don't have superficial and deep secondary. Why? Because it is one incision only. It is the primary incision only. We don't have secondary incision in C-section. It's one incision. But for the organ, the patient after doing C-section can have the, the patient can have endometritis if she has infection in the uterus, gastrointestinal infection in the gastrointestinal tract, intra-abdominal infection, deep pelvic infection, urinary system infection. So all these five types of infection are called organ-based infection. For the superficial and deep, it's only primary because there is no secondary incision. But in cabbage, the same happen. However, we have a secondary incision in the leg. So you can have superficial primary and superficial secondary. You have deep primary in the schist incision, deep secondary in the uh, leg incision. And for the organ space, since the cabbage done in the schist, C-section done in the pelvis. 
uh, see a cabbage done in the chest. So you have bone, cardiac, endometria, and endo, sorry, endocarditis, intra abdominal infection sometimes, lung infection, mediastinitis, and arterial venous infection, vascular infection. So it is surgery, one surgery, but different types of SSI can happen after the surgery. Let's go to the definition for the primary, sorry, for the superficial. Superficial, you have somebody who did a surgery, did a NHS and operative procedure, and within the 30 days after the surgery, uh, he has an infection involving the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and we can, we can define this infection by one of the following four criteria. One is enough, virulent drainage, organism identified from aseptically uh, obtained the specimen, uh, and we do not take the culture for this. The third one, superficial incision is deliberately open. We open it by the surgeon or physician or surgical team decide to reopen the incision um, and did uh, examination of the fluids, and the patient had one of the following criteria. Uh, tenderness, pain, swelling, erythema, or heat. Um, um, however, so the first criteria is bus. Second criteria is positive fluids, positive bus, positive uh, secretions. Um, the third one they open, however, when they open, they find signs of infection, which include uh, pain, tenderness, localized swelling, erythema, heat. And this, this is called one item. Why? Because sometimes they open without presence of infection. They can open just to stop bleeding. And in this case, is not SSI. They open it after the surgery. They reopen the incision um, because there is bleeding. They have to stop the bleeding but th there is no signs of infection. So this is not SSI. Uh, the fourth criteria is physician himself say this is an SSI. So this is the only situation that we take the, in the decision of health care provider. Uh, uh, he's saying there is infection, we will take it here. Why they consider the physician note here? Because usually surgeon is reluctant to say there is infection in his patient. So if he say there is infection, so we take this word uh, seriously. And again, we can categorize superficial and superficial primary and superficial secondary, and this is only in, in, in surgery that has donor incision or secondary incision. Uh, uh, superficial, let, let's go to the deep. Deep here, we have a patient who had a surgery, and within 30 or 90 days, according to the type of surgery, the patient had infection that involved the deep tissues. And when we say deep tissues, it means the muscles and fascia, and has one of the following four, uh, sorry, three items. Uh, first one is virulent drainage from the deep incision. So there is a drain from the muscles, and this drain is showing bus oozing, uh, or the incision is spontaneously dehes, means open by itself, deliberately open. Deliberately open means the surgical team open the incision. And um, a culture or non-culture microbiologic testing showing uh, uh, presence of infection organism, uh, however, or not done. However, culture or non-culture uh, that has a negative finding does not meet the criteria. So either you don't do the microbiologic testing or the microbiologic testing show, is done but positive, but not negative. Uh, so positive fine, not done is fine, but done and negative is not fine. So this is plus one of the signs of infection, including fever, 
localized pain or tenderness. Remember that this is now is deep. So uh, the, the, the signs of infection will be fever, localized pain or tenderness. So the patient, the, the, the incision was reopened either spontaneously or by decision of the surgical team. There is positive culture or not done, but not negative culture. And there is signs of uh, symptoms of infection. Or there is a radiologic method or gross anatomical method that or exam that discover a deep incisional abscess. So collection of pus uh, in the muscles and fascia will be considered. Uh, either you know this by ultrasound, you do CT, you do physical uh, open exam, uh, all are fine to detect an abscess. So presence of abscess in the skin, sorry, in the in the muscles and fascia is enough to diagnose SSI deep an organ, sorry, deep. And this is um, within 30 days or 90 days according to the type of surgery. For example, after appendectomy, 30 days, after cabbage, 90 days. You can have deep primary in most of the surgeries, but also you can have deep secondary in surgeries that have secondary incision or donor incision. Uh, the last criteria is the organ space, and this is 30 or 90 days after surgery and involve the deeper tissue. Uh, and we, we deeper tissue here um, means the organ or a space. We have organs uh, in, the, in the body and the spaces. Spaces means uh, peritoneum, pericardium, pleura, uh, mediastinum, bone, meninge meninges, and so on. So these are the same thing. Either you have virulent drainage, but here you have to have something to uh, get you the bus from the space, usually open drain, T-tube, and something like that. Or you have the organism from the deeper tissue that is positive or not cultured, but uh, uh, by, by culture non culture method, sorry, organism is positive by culture non culture method, uh, but it's not a surveillance culture. Surveillance culture means culture that is done for all surgeries. Or you have evidence of abscess using ultrasound, CT, gross anatomical, histopathologic examination. So this is called initial symptoms of presence of the SSI. However, each type of organ has its own specific criteria additional to this. So this is initial, either virulent drainage, positive fluids from the deeper uh, tissues, uh, space or organ, uh, or signs of abscess in the space or organ. Plus other criteria, each criteria is specific, for example, you have bone, you have osteomyelitis, you have mediastinitis, criteria for endocarditis, criteria for arterial nephrosis infection, and so on. So each, each one of these organ space has its own different criteria. So the, the definition of SSI is so big if you take in consideration this organ space. How we are going to report the SSI? We have reporting for event and reporting for denominator. We will go through them quickly. It's easy, uh, but just uh, uh, you need to concentrate. Let's go with the reporting of the event. Excluded organism. As you know, uh, these six organisms are fungal community pathogens. We do not consider these are pathogen for any of HAI, including uh, CLABSI, VAB, VAE, um, TAUT, and SSI. So are not, we are not using this in our definition. The other thing is latent infection is, cannot be considered SSI, including the herpes, shingles, syphilis, and tuberculosis. PATUS. PATUS means infection present at time of surgery. PATUS. And here you should have some conditions. Evidence of infection must be noted during the surgery. So the physician or the surgeon 
documented that there is infection discovered at the time of surgery. The abscess is considered evidence of infection. Wound class cannot be used for bathos determination. So, uh, irrespective of wound class, must be the same depth as the reported infection. So, if you have uh, the surgeon said there is abscess in the peritoneum, so the only SSI accepted level is organ space SSI. So if he has superficial SSI, we cannot consider this pathos because pathos need to be in the same level of documented infection. If the infection abscess was documented in the organ space, the SSI has to be in the organ space. If the documented abscess during the surgery wasn't the uh, uh, muscles and fascia, it has to be organ, uh, sorry, deep SSI, uh, not superficial, and so on. Um, example that indicate presence of infection during the surgery. Uh, I will give you the names. Uh, the, uh, these are the word that you're looking for in the patient record to know there is batus. Uh, like the word abscess, infection, virulence, bus, uh, phlegmon, uh, uh, feculent peritonitis, rupture, perforated appendix. Uh, but there is some terms, if you see, does not mean infection, uh, including perforation, contamination, necrosis, gangrene, fecal spillage, uh, neck de bowel during the procedure. So although these are problems during the surgery, they are serious, but they are they are not uh, necessarily means infection. Infection, you have to see word like infection, Abscess, virulence, and so on. It should be noted that batus is not determined by pathology reports, culture results, wound class, trauma status, imaging, testing, uh, and only determined by the physician documentation at the time of surgery. Example of batus, patient is admitted with acute abdomen, sent to OR for an exploratory laboratory, and they found ruptured appendix. And two weeks later, the patient got intra-abdominal infection, which means organ space SSI. Since the organ space SSI is the same level as ruptured appendix, we will consider this batus, um, uh, but if the same patient got infection, but not uh, intra-abdominal infection, like superficial infection, we will not consider superficial infection and batus. It would be a regular superficial incisional SSI. Attribution of multiple SSI. So if you have procedure associated with HAI uh, attributed to procedure, not the location, uh, what does it mean? In, in CLAPC, VAP, CAUTI, uh, and VAE, we, when we attributed, we attributed to the new location or old location. Like if the patient was transferred from ward to ICU, should we consider it or attribute it to the ward or ICU? It depends on the time of transfer and the time of developing SSI, uh, uh, HAI. So if it happened in the first two days of transfer, we attribute it to the first location. If it happened in the third day or after we attribute it to the new location here in ssi we do not we do not have location attribution we have surgery attribution or procedure attribution so if the patient has several surgeries done and he has one ssi so report to the operative procedure code most closely in time prior to the infection so if the patient had two surgeries during march one in the first beginning of March, and second in the middle of March, and he had SSI at the end of March. So which one should we choose and attribute the SSI to the, the second one? Because it is closely related in time to the infection. Uh, but sometimes it is difficult to say and if there is more than one surgery done closer in time uh, together, and 
uh, or more than one surgery done from the same incision, and it is difficult to know which one, uh, make sure first you can identify the reason for the infection uh, based on the type of surgery. But if not able to, then you choose uh, this uh, list of called attribution of SSI list. This is called procedure list. And in this procedure, uh, we have the higher risk above, lower risk below. So if you do two of the same patient did two of these surgeries on the same incision, like for example, they did ovarian surgery and appendix surgery, and he got infection. So uh, she got inf infection, sorry, ovarian surgery and appendix. So in the same incision, the, the surgeon did appendectomy and ovarian surgery for the lady. She got infection later on on superficial infection or deep infection. What type of surgery should be attributed to this surgery or should, should sorry, what the infection should to attribute it to which surgery of the two, the appendix or ovary. So take the highest risk, take the one that is on the top. So here appendix is higher risk than ovary. So we'll call this SSI, uh, uh, related to the appendix surgery, not the ovarian surgery. In the same way, if you have a laparotomy and gastric surgery, and you have abdominal infection uh, in the SSI, uh, you should count this SSI towards gastric surgery, not laparotomy, and so on. There is another list for thoracic surgery, neurosurgical, neck procedure, so also each one has a higher risk, lower risk, and you should follow. If two of these surgeries done on the same incision, uh, take the, the higher risk one uh, and attribute the infection to the higher risk one. If you have multiple tissue levels are involved, so if you have organ, you have infection in all, in all levels, skin, uh, subcutaneous tissue, which is superficial, uh, muscles and fascia, which is deep, organ space, uh, which is the last one. So take the deeper. So if you have superficial and deep, take the deep. If you have deep and organ space, take organ space and so on. So you report the higher. The higher means the deeper. The higher risk means the deeper one. If multiple primary incision sites of the same NHS and operative procedure become infected, report to only one SSI. So in, you know, in, in laparoscopy surgery, you have three incisions in the abdomen. If one of them get infected, you report SSI, one SSI. But if more than, if the three, all the three have been infected, do you report one SSI or three SSI? You create one form or three forms. You create only one form, even though you have multiple incision infected because the multiple incision represent one incision, one surgery. Uh, if you have surgery with secondary incision, remember that the surveillance period for secondary incision is only 30 days all the time. And uh, so if infection happened after 30 days in the secondary incision, it's not an SSI toward the surgery. Uh, what are the procedures that have a secondary incision or a donor incision, uh, including cabbage, uh, carotid in the, uh, cabbage in the heart, carotid in the arterectomy, in the neck muscle, in the neck vessels, sorry. They open the carotid artery and they remove the uh, atheroma from uh, the artery. It's a major surgery and can produce a serious complication. Uh, colostomy reversal. Uh, they do another incision uh, to allow for fecal matter uh, to be uh, uh, to go to outside. So they get opening uh, for colostomy uh, surgery and so on. So here are the surgeries that has two incision: primary incision for the surgery and secondary incision to help uh, as a donor site, as a site for. Um, 
the the stoma for the feces or stoma for urine or whatever. Manipulation of operative site. SSI will not be considered if these three criteria happen together during the post-operative period procedure, uh, the post-operative procedure period, the surgical site is without evidence of infection. An invasive or manipulation or accession of the site is performed for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. An infection subsequently happened. So what does it mean? If you have a patient after surgery does not show any signs of infection, and for some reason he went to a doctor that he inserted something in the incision or the patient himself inserted something in the incision or manipulated the incision and later on the incision get infected we cannot consider this surgical site infection due to the presence of surgery but we would consider this as infection due to manipulation in the incision so we will not report this as SSI For the denominator, we have different scenarios here. If you have two procedures performed, performed during the same trip to the OR through the same incision, the common example for this is cabbage and cardiac surgery. Cabbage is about the arteries of the heart. Cardiac is about the valves, the septum of the heart. So they are related surgeries, can be done together. So do, do you fill one form or two forms? Since there are two separate surgery, according to NHSN, we fill two forms. The only exception is when you start your surgery, scabbage C and you end with scabbage B. Like you, you plan to do cabbage surgery through, through only chest incision. So when they do the chest incision, they take the artery or vein from internal memory, uh, internal memory visits. So they do only single incision in the chest, take the internal memory visits and insert it in the heart. So only one incision. But sometimes they find difficulty getting the internal memory. So they start to do an incision in the leg and this would be the secondary incision. So they converted the surgery from cabbage chest incision only to cabbage chest and leg incision. This is the only exception. If you have this fill, the second one, which is cabbage, chest, and, uh, and leg incision. Because you start the chest only, but you did uh, uh, additionally leg incision. So now it is not anymore chest only. It is chest and uh, leg, so you cabbage both. You don't fill two forms, one form only for cabbage both. If you have bilateral surgery, you, you know you have a patient who have right knee replacement and left knee replacement. Do you fill uh, one form or two forms? If it is right and left with two decision with two incisions, two forms, right and left knee, right and left hip. But if you have right and left by the same incision, like the hernia, right and left hernia herniectomy, sorry, herniography, you fill one form. So if you have a right and left together uh, herniography using the same incision, fill one form. But if you have right and left hernia using right and left incision, it's two surgery now. Right and left hip uh, using two, of course uh, you have to have two incisions then it is two surgery. Now you have, you fill two forms. But in case of uh, two, two forms, you have to make sure you know the time for each type, yani right, how long the, the right continued and how long the left continued. If you cannot get this information, get the total time and divide it by two. If so, if the right and left hip replacement took four hours, consider, two hours for the right and two hours for the left. A single procedure with multiple incision, like cabbage both, you fill one form only. So cabbage, although we have two incision, one in the chest and one in the leg, you fill one form only. Two operative procedures are performed during the same trip 
to the OR through separate incision. So since it is two procedures, separate incision, two folds. Again, actual time will be split uh, evenly between the two surgeries. Two operative procedure with 24 hours through within 24 hours through the same incision, you sum up the time and fill uh, one form for the original surgery. So now you you did a cabbage both, and after surgery, you have a problem in the heart. So they open again on the same day. They take the patient to the OR, open the same incision and did a cardiac surgery to stop bleeding or to stop the complication from happening. Now you fill one form to the original cabbage, but remember that the time now is the combined time for the original surgery, which is the cabbage, and the additional time that was added at the end of the day to do the additional surgery, which is the cardiac surgery. Replacement of both mitral and tricuspid valve during the same trip to the OR. Although it is two valve replacement, but it's still called cardiac surgery, you fill one form. Total or partial hip replacement. Uh, again, you fill one form uh, for, uh, for the same, for uh, the two different uh, procedure. Total or partial revision of hip or knee is different procedure, but it's still uh, or different uh, way of doing the surgery. Still, it is the same name of surgery you fill one form. If the patient expires during the uh, during the operation in the OR, do we do surveillance? No, um, you don't fill anything because we don't. Uh, you may ask the patient die, and you don't fill SSI form. Yes, because the patient die before SSI is uh, is developed. A strictomy procedure should be designated as abdominal or vaginal based on the approach. So you fill one form for hysterectomy, but you want to make sure is, is it abdominal hysterectomy or vaginal hysterectomy because they are different surgery according to NHSM. So removing the uterus through the abdomen is called abdominal hysterectomy. Removing the uterus from the vagina is called vaginal um, hysterectomy. And these are two different, but you fill one form according to the surgery. Uh, hysterectomy, okay. So I think I'm done. Uh, we give you good information about the SSI. Uh, 